Hello and welcome to Exodus chapter 8. Today we are going to be covering uh, plagues number 2, 3, and 4. We have the frogs, the gnats, and the flies. Next week we're going to cover Exodus chapter 9, and that's going to get plagues uh, 5, 6, and 7, which is livestock, boils, and hail. Uh, before I forget, I always forget to say this, but please do subscribe um, to the YouTube channel. If you're watching on our website on ironsheep.org, you can just click on the little, on the bottom right is the little Iron Sheep logo. You can just click on that and that'll allow you to subscribe. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can click on that. If you're listening to this, please like or subscribe, whatever um, podcast platform you're using. Doing that raises us up as far as in the search engines of these features. The more likes and subscribes we get, the higher our ranking and the more value this content is seen to have by Google and all its affiliates, etc. cetera. Um, okay, that's the end of that disclosure. Um, let's pray and then let's get into this. We got some ground to cover. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your creation. Thank you that you have allowed us and you've given us dominion over it to subdue it, to use it, to sustain ourselves through it. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you show us your power through each of these plagues and your ultimate control over creation. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, speak through me, that you will show us something about your character, about who you are, that we will have soft hearts and open ears to hear your message. Dedicate this time to you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's dig into this. Um, before we get into uh, 8... Uh, chapter 8, I found this um, chart that I want to put up on the screen. Sorry for those that are listening, but um, there is a chart that uh, I have up on the screen that is four rows um, by one, two, three, four, five, six columns. And what you discover when you put all the plagues, so this is the 10 plagues going from one through 10 down, you see a series of sets. So Plagues 1 through 3 is the first series. Plagues 4 through 6 is the second series. Plagues 7 through 9 is the third series. And the fourth is not a series. It is just simply the 10th plague. But what you see is, in, in, in for the, those that are listening, in the columns going uh, left to right, the first column you have is plague. The next column over is forewarning. Was Pharaoh given a warning or not? The next column is what was the time of the warning? When was the warning given? The next column is instruction. Was there any instruction that was given to Moses and Aaron? The next column is what was affected? What was the, the what did the plague have an effect on? And the final column I have here is Israel set apart. Is Israel set apart? Meaning that does the plague affect everyone or does it just affect the Egyptians? And as we look down, plague one through three, you have warning given for plague one, the blood and the frogs. Warning is given beforehand. But plague number three of the gnats, there's no warning given. You go to the next series. Number four, flies. Number five, livestock. Both of those are preceded by a warning. Then the sixth, boils, no warning given. Uh, number seven and eight, hail and locusts. Warning is given to Pharaoh. And then number nine, no warning is given. Then you also see the time of the warning. The first in the sets of three, uh, number one, number four, and number seven, all happen in the morning. The warning is given in the morning. And the location, the instruction is given for one, four, and seven, station yourself. Go to this location and wait for Pharaoh to come to you. Whereas number two, five, and eight, the instruction that's given is go to Pharaoh. Now, one thing that we notice is that with 1 and 2, 4 and 5, 7 and 8, the dialogue with Pharaoh, uh, the plague is given, Pharaoh's heart is hard, he says he won't do it, the next plague is given, Pharaoh says, okay, you know what, I will relent, I will renege, I will allow you, excuse me, renege's not the wrong word, I will allow you to go and be released and go worship your God in the desert. But then he reneges on his... Uh, commitment, his allowing uh, the Israelites to leave. He changes his mind. His heart is hardened. And so that is immediately followed up with a 
a hard-hitting plague that God dishes out. And that's where we get number three, number six, and number nine that have no warning. And each of those that has no warning is followed, follows immediately on the tail of Pharaoh saying he's going to do a thing, then changing his mind. Uh, his heart was hard in that situation. Then you have the affected area uh, or, or element. So plagues number one and number seven affect water. Uh, number one is the water of the Nile being turned into blood. Number seven is hail. We also see number nine is the darkness. That's also an element uh, of being light. Then you have the animal kingdom being affected. Frogs, gnats, flies, livestock, locusts. Um, all affect the animal kingdom. Number six and number 10 affect both man and animals. We know the boils are over uh, mankind, but also over the cattle. And in the same way, um, the death of the firstborn also affects the cattle, uh, which is interesting. But ultimately, it is the uh, firstborn um, that has, I mean, this is the worst of the plagues. Uh, and we'll talk about that as we get into it. As Moses gives the warning for it, um, well, I'm not even getting into that. Uh, you'll have to wait in, until we get to um, the tenth plague. So I hope this is helpful, just to see all the different plagues as they're played out here. Genesis 1:28 is where God gives dominion and control of the earth, of the livestock, of the fields, uh, of everything over to man. It is our responsibility to be a steward of the earth and all the elements within it, all the animals, the livestock, the birds, the fish, all of that, to subdue them and to sustain ourselves from them. God uses these elements. He uses uh, his creation to show that he is sovereign. He is in charge. He has control over the elements, over his creation. And that's what we see in the plagues. So let's uh, now go on. We're going to read, um, we're doing this in three chunks uh, based simply off of um, each plague. So the first plague that we're going to talk about is the frogs. So join me as we're going to read Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Exodus 8, 1 through 5. Seven days passed after the Lord struck the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and, and your bedroom and onto your bed and into the houses of your officials and all your people, into your ovens and your kneading troughs. The frogs will come up on you and your people and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Saren so stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up, covering the land. But the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord to take away the frogs. Excuse me. Pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your house may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said. Moses replied, It will be as you say, so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials and your people. They will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh, and the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards, and in the fields. They were piled into heaps, and the land reeked of them. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Okay. So frogs were considered sacred in Egypt at this time. Frogs were a, a symbol of heket, 
which was the Egyptian goddess of fertility, uh, represented by a frog. To the Egyptians, the frog was an ancient symbol of fertility related to the annual flooding of the Nile. Haket was originally the female counterpart of Kanum, which we talked about last week, or the wife of Kanum, by whom she became the mother of her Ur. It has been proposed that her name is the origin of the name Heket, the Greek goddess of witchcraft. A plague of the frogs could be seen as an attack on Heket. As I mentioned last week, uh, the Egyptians had a whole series of different types of gods um, for all sorts of different elements were represented uh, by the gods with different elements of, of hawks and 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 dog heads and and frogs. I am not a specialist in Greek mytho- Greek in uh, Egyptian mythology or in the Egyptian gods. And the Bible doesn't tell us that uh, each of these is specifically targeting each of these gods. There is a verse, and we're going to hit on it, in which, and I'll put it up on the screen, in which. Uh, the Bible does say that God did bring these plagues to battle with the Egyptian gods. So we do know that is a part of it. If it is these specific gods that I'm mentioning, I don't know. It's logical, though. And we just follow the logic of, well, Heket uh, is represented by a frog. She's got a frog head. So obviously, if a plague of frogs comes on, then this is an attack on Heket. Um, so you have this element, this thing that is sacred to Egypt that now is everywhere, is overwhelming, is a complete annoyance everywhere. Now, there is the the naturalistic explanation, which I talked about last week. The naturalistic explanation is this idea simply that um, this naturally happened. Uh, so the Nile, we talked about that there is an annual flooding and that if the flooding is especially... Uh, high that there can be red silt that is kicked up from the upstream waters, and that can also bring on spores that can kill the fish. Did God use that to cause the Nile to look like it was turned to blood, or was it actually turned to blood? I don't know. I do believe personally that it was turned to blood. The thing that is miraculous that you cannot get away from is the timing of it. And each of these, the timing of each of these plagues is instantaneous. And the fact that there's a warning given for the majority of them. And then the fact that there is uh, Israel being set apart. That is a humongous sign. Additionally, if you want to try to give it a naturalistic explanation of saying that the frogs, for example, uh, well, the Nile was clearly toxic. And so the frogs wanted to avoid being in the toxic water. So they left the water and then they were seeking shade. So that's why they came into the homes. They went into cool places. That's why they went into the ovens and to the kneading troughs and into the bedrooms because they were seeking cool places. Um, but the fact that that Moses was able to say to Pharaoh, when do you want them to be killed? When do you want them removed? And Moses had the ability to name the time. That shows God's sovereignty over this. That is another element, is an interesting thing here, is Moses gives Pharaoh the opportunity to say, okay, I'll give you the honor. When do you want this plague to end? Why does Pharaoh say tomorrow? I don't understand that. I don't get that. Why would Pharaoh not say immediately? But he says tomorrow. I heard one pastor uh, use this as an illustration of living in sin, that we get so used to our sin and comfortable in our sin that we want to enjoy one more day with it, one more, one more evening living in our sin. We know we need to give up this thing, so let's have one more hurrah with the sin. And I don't know if that's putting something there that's not there, but it's an interesting thought. Verse 7, we see uh, the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Again, we don't know. Um, This is the third time that the... Um, Janice and Jambres, the magicians, the sorcerers of Egypt. Um, we don't know if this is sleight of hand, 
if this is a trick. Uh, it says by their secret arts. So it could just be a sleight of hand trick type thing. Or is it possible that there's demonic influence in this, that they are able to replicate um, the plague? We did see them able to replicate the first sign that was given, which was uh, Aaron's staff being turned into a snake. They were able to replicate that. Then they were able to replicate the Nile, the water being turned into blood or looking like blood. Maybe they just tossed in red food dye. Uh, then this third one, they are able to bring frogs up on the land. I don't know what they did or how they did it, but we do know that they were able to add to the frogs. This is an interesting commentary. They weren't able to solve the problem of removing the frogs or lessening the frogs. All they were able to do is add to the problem. This is immediately followed by verse 8, where Pharaoh summons Moses and Aaron and says, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away. This is Pharaoh is acknowledging the fact that God alone is the one who can remove the plague. On some level here, Pharaoh is cracking and realizing that, okay, my magicians are able to replicate this, but they're not able to remove this. I need Moses and Aaron to talk to their God, the God of the Hebrews, and to do something about this. There is an, is, is an obvious element of Pharaoh acknowledging God's power, but clearly uh, he doesn't acknowledge his full power, the full strength and might of God, because he doesn't, he doesn't believe uh, as soon as it happens, uh, his heart is hardened, and he doesn't believe that God truly is sovereign over everything, and he's stubborn, and he doesn't want to relent. And so we see him, um, verse 15, he hardened his heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Continuing on to plague number three, the plague of gnats. Let's read 16 through 19. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats. They did this. And when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came on, on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. When the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Since the gnats were on people and animals and everywhere, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. Notice that no warning is given. We saw in the previous plague on verse uh, 8, um, Pharaoh says that I'll let your people go uh, so that you can sacrifice to the Lord if you remove the frogs. So then Moses prays, and God listens, and the frogs all die, and Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and then that is followed up immediately by the plague of gnats. The plague of gnats. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, a little word study on gnat. Uh, Cain is the uh, Hebrew word here. It's used five times in Exodus 8. It's also in Isaiah 51.6, if you want to look that up. The word could mean lice. It could also mean mosquito. So in my NIV here, it translates it as gnat, but it's translated as lice in the King James, the New King James, and the ASV. Uh, it could also be translated as mosquito. We know that it is a pesky tiny bug, um, but it's not a fly. We know that for certain. So there is potential judgment here on the God Set. Now, this is might be a little bit of a stretch, and the reason being is, is that Set is the God of the desert. He's not God of the gnats, but he's God of the desert. And the reason why this could be an attack on Set is, is the attack on the desert, that it is the dust of the desert that is, is what uh, is brought up to cause the gnats. So that could be a correlation to Set. Um, in the Osiris myth, Set is portrayed as the usurper who murdered uh, and mutilated his own brother Osiris. We talked about that uh, last week as well. So the one thing we know for certain, and I want to talk about dust. The word dust uh, in the Hebrew is afar. 
And it could mean dust, earth, ashes, ground, mortar, rubbish, or debris. And we leave your marker here, and we're going to flip all the way back to Genesis, starting in Genesis 2. So flip with me to Genesis 2, and we're going to start in verse 7. Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Uh, turn a few pages over to Genesis 3, 19. For me, that's just one page. Genesis 3, 19. This is God, uh, after the fall, talking to Adam. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. From ashes to ashes is uh, another um, interpretation of that. Okay, now flip a few more uh, over to Genesis 13. Genesis 13, verse 16. Genesis 13, 16. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. This is part of the Abrahamic covenant, where God is telling Abraham that he is going to make him into a mighty nation to the extent of being the dust of the land. This word, afar, dust, uh, Ashes, earth, ground, rubbish, debris, mortar is very significant. It shows that God uses his creation, his dirt, his mortar has all the elements of life in it. In fact, um, it's one of my tattoos here. I have the Hebrew word here for Dust, afar, is tattooed right here as a reminder to me that this body, this casing, uh, this temple, if you want to call it that, is formed out of dust. And that when I die, it's going to go back to being dust. It's going to go back to being rubbish. That God created this shell, this casing for my soul, for me to be able to use uh, here on earth but I'm going to return to dust and that without God, that that's all that I am is his creation is, is made from that same carbon material that is in everything. Uh, I enjoy the illustration or story. A evolutionary scientist goes to God and says, we don't need you. We have proved that we are able to create life from nothing. We have proved we don't need you. And God says, wow, um, that's impressive. Good for you. Uh, can you. Can you show me this? I want to see. And the evolutionary scientist says, yes, absolutely. Watch what we can do. And he goes outside and he grabs a handful of dirt and God says, ah, what you're holding in your hand right there, that has the blueprint of all creation the carbon, the atoms, everything in that I created. And from that, that is my building block. You need to get your own dirt. I love that illustration because within a handful of dirt is everything to create life, is in there. The carbon, everything, uh, uh, the atoms, the DNA, all these different elements, dust, from dust we were created into dust we will return. I would argue that it takes more faith to believe that something as complicated as mankind, or even to go simpler than that, an atom came from nothing. If you look at uh, Earth's history, I remember when I was a little kid, the age of the Earth was in millions of years. And now we're in billions upon billions of years, simply because the probability, the probability of going from goo to you or nothing to something, uh, they realize how much time is needed. Nothing goes from chaos into order in creation. That you, you don't see that happen. You don't see that happen. 
I could I could keep going off on this tangent, but uh, God takes the blueprint of His creation, the base element of dust, and He takes from that dust, whew, and He turns it into gnats that go throughout Egypt and torment the Egyptians. Let's continue on. Ah, uh, verse 18 and 19. Uh, Janice and Jambres are not able to replicate this. Uh, oh, flip back to Exodus. Um, 18. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. This is the finger of God, is what they said to Pharaoh. The sorcerers, the uh, guides to Pharaoh... Uh, had met their match. They realized that they were not able to recreate this, and this is of God, of something more powerful than the Egyptian gods. Also imagine uh, the terror they had in admitting to Pharaoh that they were beat, that they couldn't uh, match this Hebrew God. Um, yeah, I would not have wanted to been in that throne room when they realized this. Um Verse 16 and 17 is an interesting thing to note. Um, Aaron is featured speaking before Pharaoh, um, and his staff is mentioned being used, but this is the last time that Aaron individually is isolated and set out. Um, Aaron's staff, Aaron is the one who is the mouthpiece for Moses, who speaks to Pharaoh for Moses. But moving on from here, we're going to see Aaron lessen. He's still very much involved, but we're going to see Moses uh, being lifted up and being used more. Also, Moses' staff uh, will be used uh, from here on out as well. When the staff is used, it's Moses' staff that's used, although it's not always used. God doesn't always use a staff to bring about. So an application here is if you recall... Exodus chapter 3 is where God speaks to Moses through the burning bush. And Moses' response at first is he's timid and he says, you know, why choose me? Who am I? Uh, but then in f chapter 4, M Moses straight up says, please choose somebody else. Uh, I, I'm slow of speech. You've got the wrong guy, basically. Please choose somebody else. And we see God get frustrated with Moses and suggest Aaron. He says, okay, what about your brother Aaron? Aaron will be your mouthpiece. Fine, we'll use Aaron. Then we see Moses growing in confidence, growing in strength into being the man that God wants him to be. And from this, it actually gives me confidence. Moses is called by God to do something. Moses doesn't think he's able to, and he negotiates with God. And God says, okay. God changes his mind. Now, I don't know about changes his mind, but he, he's willing to, he acknowledges the fact that Moses needs time. The man that God wants him to be, he, Moses doesn't step up in that moment in Exodus 3 or 4 when God calls him to do so. But still, God works with Moses, and Moses' faith increases, and he becomes the man God wants him to be and needs him to be to lead Israel. And as we continue on, we're only in chapter 8 here. We have so much ground to cover in Exodus, and we're going to see Moses become the man God wants him to be. It gives me faith that if I screw up, if I fall short of what God wants me to do, which Paul in Romans says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all are sinful. We all are broken, and we will all fail. It gives me hope here to see that when Moses says, Lord, please choose somebody else, God says, okay, Fine, we'll use Aaron. But he continues to walk alongside Moses and build him up. It gives me hope that God will do the same with me and the same with you. Um, another interesting note here with the, the uh, gnats. There's no mention of this plague actually ending. Interesting thing to note. So the question is, did the gnats just stay for an extended period of time? We don't know. This also happens with... Uh, Plague number six, the boils. It doesn't say that the boils just suddenly went away. Did they remain uh, 
until the Egyptians actually let the Israelites go and they leave Egypt? I don't know. Or did they slowly go away? I don't know. It could have been that they stayed until the Israelites left as a, a continual reminder and a continual annoyance. I don't know. But let's. it's just an interesting thing to note that there is no, nothing mentioned in the scripture about the plague actually ending, whereas the frogs, they all died. And with the other plagues, they eventually ended. Plague number four, flies. So let's continue on, and we're going to read the rest of chapter 8, starting on verse 20. Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials, on your people, and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Even the ground will be covered with them. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will occur tomorrow. And the Lord did this. Dense swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's palace and into the houses of his officials, and throughout Egypt the land was ruined by the flies. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God here in this land. But Moses said, That would not be right. The sacrifices we offer to the Lord our God would be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable to their eyes, will they not stone us? We must take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God as he commanded us. Pharaoh said, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the wilderness, but you must not go very far. Now pray for me. Verse 29, Moses answered, as soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord, and tomorrow the flies will leave Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Only let Pharaoh be sure that he does not act deceitfully again, but by not letting the people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Then Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did what Moses asked. The flies left Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Not a fly remained. But this time also, Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. So a few things to hit on here, but before, uh, an interesting thing that happened this morning. I don't know why, it's totally random, but I have killed in my office here six flies. I have never noticed flies in this office before. It might be because it's starting to get cold outside. I don't know, but as I was sitting prepping, I started to hear a buzzing. I went and killed a fly. I thought it was just one. Then another one came, another one, another one, and another one. There were six in total that I killed. Uh, don't know if it's just random. I think not, but just six were incredibly pesky, and I didn't want them buzzing around as I was filming. Uh, I can't imagine the torment that would go through uh, just in experiencing these flies everywhere over everything. Uh, revelation in the tribulation, there are uh, stinging insects that come in swarms and attack. It's one of the plagues that is brought out uh, in one of the judgments on mankind. And the pain is so bad from these stings that people will want to die but won't be able to die. I'm grateful for the fact that uh, we, I do believe in the rapture of the church and I do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture that we will be counted lucky to avoid these things. Uh, one of the scriptures says, uh, consider yourselves lucky to be counted worthy to avoid these things. Um, that's a whole other talk. Uh, Thessalonians is where you get the word rapture. Um, it's harpazo uh, is in the Latin Vulgate um, or the Latin uh, or, yeah, or is it Greek? I don't remember. Uh, Matthew 24 is a study that I do all about eschatology in the end times. Matthew 24, I do a two-part, nine, 90-minute uh, talk that's all about the end times and I hit on the rapture. 
Didn't mean to go into that, but just went on the tangent based on the flies. Um, okay, continuing on to my notes. Uh, the Egyptian god of the flies is Kaniti Amantiyu. Kaniti Amantiyu, also known as Kahiti Amantiyu. It's just a different spelling of it. Uh, he was a god of the dead and was usually depicted as a man with the head of a jackal or a dog. Um, he was considered to be the ruler of the cemetery and was associated with the god Anubis, who was also a god of the dead. His role was to protect the dead and to guide them to the afterlife. He was considered god of the flies, and I'm guessing that the correlation between the dead and flies or the reason why he was called the, dead, the, the god of the flies is because he's also god of the dead, and oftentimes, um, well, flies obviously uh, swarm and... and um, on dead animals and dead things. So is this an attack on this God? Very well could be. We see another situation where God is using his creation to attack what the Egyptians see as their gods. Uh, another thing to note is that no staff is used for this plague. Uh, in the past, we've had Aaron's staff be used. Uh, the upcoming plague, seven, eight, and nine, we're going to see Moses' staff be used. But I, I think that this is to show that God doesn't need a conjuring element. It's not the magic of the staff that causes these things to happen. It is God that is causing each of these to happen and not some m magic piece of wood. Uh, verses 22 and 23, God set apart Goshen. Verses 22 and 23, we see... Uh, on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. We see this here in plague number four, uh, but we're also going to see this uh, play out in plague number five, which is the livestock, as well as number seven, which is hail, uh, and number nine, which is the darkness, and number 10 is the death of the firstborn. Each of those plagues, uh, seven, nine, and 10, is going to be exclusively on Egypt, but Goshen, the land where the Hebrews were, um, is not affected. This is yet an additional sign of God's sovereignty and control and his power. And the, and, and the naturalistic argument, I don't know how you can come up with that. How can you have it not affect that specific area consistently across these four uh, different plagues? I don't know how you can justify that or explain that. The purpose of this is to show God's strength. He is showing Pharaoh, Egypt, the Israelites, and us today that God is in control and is sovereign and is powerful over his creation. Verse 25 is interesting. So verse 25 is where God says, excuse me, Pharaoh says to Moses and Aaron, go sacrifice to your God here in the land. And then we have in verse 26, Moses' response, that would not be right. The sacrifices we offered our Lord God would be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in their eyes, will they not stone us? I read one commentary that's made the comment that uh, Moses is being shrewd here uh, in negotiating. He is just using a negotiating tactic to negotiate with Pharaoh. Um, but I believe that if you, in digging just a little bit deeper, we know that certain animals were considered sacred to the Egyptians. Sacrifice to animals is not something that was done. And Moses even said, says here that our sacrifices will be considered detestable to the Egyptians to the extent that the Egyptians would want to kill the Israelites for doing the animal sacrifices. I believe that Pharaoh is trying to trick Moses by saying, you know what? You can do your sacrifices, sacrifice to your Lord, just do it here. And in doing that, Pharaoh is hoping that Moses will accept that offer, do the sacrifice. And then the Egyptians will be so upset that they are doing these animal sacrifices to sacred animals to them that the Egyptians themselves will rise up to kill the Israelites and Pharaoh's problem will be solved. But Moses, this is my interpretation, sees past that. 
Moses sees what Pharaoh's trying to do and says, nope, nope. If we do that, the Egyptians themselves will try to stone us. No, we need to honor what our God, the Hebrew God, has requested, that we go out into the desert to worship him. Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff there. Now, verse 28, you see Pharaoh say, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the wilderness, but you must not go very far. Then you see Moses' response, as soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord. When I read that through, it was almost as if Pharaoh was trying to keep some element of power and control and show to Moses that he still is a power and is still king. Okay, Moses, I will let you go. If I don't let you go, you can't go, but I will do this. And then you see Moses' response, and Moses is like, um, no, you, you don't have the power here. Uh, as soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord, and tomorrow the flies will leave Pharaoh. Moses is saying, God has the power, and he's given it to me to be God over you in this situation, as we discussed uh, two weeks ago or last week. Uh, I don't recall. Uh, but it's just an interesting play on uh, Pharaoh trying to show that he still has the power. And then we see, uh, as usual, uh, Pharaoh hardening his heart. But an interesting thing that happens here, verse 28 stands out to me. In the midst of all of this, Pharaoh says, pray for me. And this gave me pause. Uh, Moses is asked to pray for Pharaoh. Uh, Philippians 2.10, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Bible says that everyone will acknowledge that Jesus is God. In Revelation, it talks about the fact that just and right are your decrees. Everyone, including the judged, will declare that God is right. In their condemnation, their judgment unto death, uh, they will acknowledge that just and right is God in his judgments. The whole world, all of creation is going to acknowledge that God is God, that Jesus is Lord. And there's an element, there's a God-sized hole in every single human being's chest. And only God can fill that. Now we try, as mankind, to fill it ourselves. And you can see any number of things that we try to fill it with. Possession is the most common, I would say, but there's also uh, position, uh, and you see that a lot in Facebook, in trying to garner up as many friends and followers as you can and be an influencer. Uh, so you have possessions, you have power in, in the idea of power over others, popularity. Uh, look at that, those are all Ps. Possession, popularity, power, but ultimately... The only thing that will satisfy that, that quench we have is the Holy Spirit. When we become a Christ follower and invite God into our lives, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. We, the Bible talks about our bodies being a temple for the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit lives within us. And as such, we should take care of the temple. Uh, a verse that I want us to read on, and this is uh, to end it, is that we're going to flip uh, all the way to the New Testament. We're going to Romans. Go to Romans chapter 1 for me. Romans chapter 1. I'll give you a second to get there. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 21. Romans 1, 18 through 21. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. God has made his truth, his existence, plain to everybody. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities 
His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. His creation, and I've said this multiple times, my personal story, it was God's creation that called to me. Growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I loved going on hikes in the, wil- in the woods, in the wilderness. I loved the mountains, the cascades. And then going to the University of Colorado uh, for my undergraduate degree, the, the Flatirons, Boulder, the Rocky Mountains, seeing just his creation just called to me. There's got to be a creator. There's no way this is random. It's too perfect. It's too gorgeous. It's too artistic. It was clearly designed by an artist. And that's what this is saying in Romans uh, 1 here. It, it, Paul is telling us and validating the fact that the creation, what God has created, testifies to the extent that no one has an excuse. We all have been told and been made note of God's existence. Uh, verse 21, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, but there's an element where he knows the truth and he asks Moses to pray for him. Pharaoh knows with the the plague of the frogs. He knows that only God can remove it. He knows, but as Paul says here in Romans, um, their hearts were darkened. I would make the argument that on some level, every person in creation knows that God exists, even the atheist on some level knows it. And why am I so confident to say that? Because the Bible says it right here, that no one is without excuse. There's no excuse you can give of saying, well, I didn't know. I didn't know that God exists. There is that question of what about people who uh, are um, in a distant island that never hear the gospel. And this is a, a testament to the fact that God's invisible qualities will be made known to them. So as we wrap up, uh, that's my call is for those people who have a hard heart that you know, pray for them. In the same way that Moses prays for Pharaoh, God alone is the one who changes hearts. We cannot change a person's heart. We cannot save them. We can pray for them. And if you are lucky, God will ask you to be used to influence a person's life. But it is God, the Holy Spirit alone, who changes hearts. So the one thing we can do, and it is very powerful, is pray. Pray for those people who have those hard hearts. And on that note, let's close with prayer. Lord, I pray for uh, every person who's listening or watching right now, that you would put on their hearts somebody that they should pray for that is in their life that seems to have a hard heart, that they would pray that you would soften it. You give us this power to communicate directly with you through prayer, and I'm so grateful for it, and that you listen to us. Both large asks and small asks, you listen, and I'm so grateful for that. The creator of everything cares about little me, Uh, this small, little, individual person. And I'm so grateful for that. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for caring. For all this in Jesus' name. Join next week as we continue on uh, with the next three plagues.